So I'm going to keep that out so the accolade has an easier time getting up. But now we're about to play the game of how many weeks before the pastor bites it in worship. (laughs) So this morning we're finishing up our series on what it means to be born again. And if you're anything like me going through this uh, series, preparing it, we realize that there's a lot deeper implications to this sense of being born again than just the bumper sticker version of it or the cliche that we toss out of the litmus test about whether or not somebody is really Christian or really saved or really redeemed, but that this understanding of being born again is something that drives us into a very uh, significant wrestling match with what it means to be a person that is created as a spirit, with what that means about how it uh, abuts up against this mind that we have and, and how the world passes through that mind and how the spirit in turn tries to focus itself through the mind into the world. And today we come to the last piece, which is what does it mean to be born again of our body? What does it mean to renew our sense of of body. Now, as you might suspect, there might be a little bit more to this than meets the eye. But in a very simple nutshell, to be reborn of body means to get our perspective shifted properly as to what our body is, why we have it, and how we're supposed to use it. Kind of like what said to the kids up here today, right? It brings us back to that initial quote from C.S. Lewis that sort of drove the first message about being born of spirit. See if anybody remembers some of this. It says, you don't have a spirit. You, you are a spirit. You have a body, right? So there's a sense that the essence of who we are is spirit, not this thing that we see in the mirror every single day. But the reality is when we look in the mirror, what is it that we're looking at? We're looking at our body. I don't see my spirit. I see my body. Now, If you are even remotely like me and you wake up in the morning and the first thing you see in the mirror, brushing your teeth or shaving your face or whatever it is you're doing and you are not dressed for the day and you are maybe revealing more of yourself than you would outside the bathroom, what you see is more of yourself than you would like to have present in the world. And it is very easy to become preoccupied with the appearance and that reflection in the mirror and forget about the spirit that animates it. And in so many ways, that is something that we have to fight against day in and day out because the world is not shy about trying to convince us to focus on what's on the outside above what's on the inside. That's what most of our advertising jumps at. It's what drives us in so many ways that we want to impress people, we want to have a certain look about us, and if you think about it, even most Christians throughout the week are more likely to spend more time exercising at the gym, doing things that they would consider to be healthy living, than to be engaged in practices that would uplift and transform the spirit. We spend more time running and lifting and doing all these other things that we do in the Word of God than we do in the house of God, than we do in prayer, than we do in fellowship with other believers. And so we spend lots of time trying to build up this thing here and less time trying to build up what really matters, us, our spirit. We spend a lot of time. How how many of you right now are on a diet? Well, technically, we're all on a diet. The question is, what kind of diet is it? (laughs) 
Most people at one point or another are watching what they eat. Now, we watch what we eat maybe because we're trying to shed a few pounds or trying to keep a few pounds off. Some of us have to watch our diet because we have a particular uh, uh, physical condition, uh, a, d- a disease, some kind of a con- uh, ailment. And what we put into our body has an effect on whether or not we stay healthy or not. So we have this obsession with what am I doing? What am I consuming within my body? But the question is really, what is the diet for my spirit? What am I doing to build that up? Now, what we're about to see is that it doesn't mean, like we talked about last week. Remember we talked about like the training ground for the mind? We talked about the training, the gym Nasium for the mind in order to transform it so that it is more in keeping with our spirit and that's things like the word of God and prayer and worship and those kinds of things well with the body it doesn't mean that we don't have to worry about keeping ourselves healthy and believe me I know what my diet has been for the past six months I'm a United Methodist and United Methodists do three things Drive fast, sing loud, and eat way too much. So this was a bit of a convicting message, particularly about what we're uh, going to get into here in just a second. But this sense of caring for our body is not something that should be absent from us. It just needs to be in the right perspective about the why. Okay? Because Paul talks about the body being a temple and this is a really really apt description of the body because if we think about biblically and we talk about the physical house of God's spirit in the world it is the temple right that's why they built the temple in Jerusalem it was the house of God it was supposed to be where the spirit of God dwelt most powerfully most significantly that's what it was well if we are a spirit and our spirit has a home, it just happens to be a mobile home, then it is a very apt description to call that spirit or that, that, uh, that home a temple, our body. And if we understand what a temple is used for, then we start to understand what our body is used for. This is a house of God. We don't call this a temple, we call it a church, but it's just kind of tomato and tomato in my book. What's the purpose of this building? To do what? Worship? Minister? Right? That's the point of this building. We come together so that we can worship God and so that we can find ways to minister to the world around us, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that we hope transforms the world more into the kingdom of God. If our body is a temple, that's the reason we've got a body. The purpose is it is the vehicle that our spirit uses to act in the world in a way that transforms it more into the kingdom of God. Now, would you consider it sinful for me to eat two Twinkies a day? I see nervous laughter. No. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) See, when it comes to things that we put into our bodies a lot of times, we can rationalize it. That's not really a problem. That's not really doing anything too terrible to me. It's no big deal. But let me ask you this. Would it be sinful if just because I like to tear things down, I came in and knocked that pillar out of the middle of the church in the middle of the week? just to see what happens. Or if I went down in the electrical box and just ripped all the wiring out just because I like to watch sparks fly and was just kind of waiting to see, will it catch the building on fire? Would that be sinful? Yes! Of course it would be. There are so many things wrong with those actions. And the thing is, it At its core, it's because we realize that the house of God, the place we come to worship, the place that is the central location where we strategize, where we grow together, and we strive to spread the gospel into the world, inviting people in to be discipled before Jesus Christ, we understand that we need to keep this place in good repair so it is effective to do the thing it's supposed to do. So if I'm intentionally 
messing that up, that is a problem. And there's something quite right upstairs if I call myself a Christian and I go around doing that kind of stuff. We just don't, I, I can tell you, I'll, well, maybe you do. I don't often turn that same mentality inward on myself. I don't think about my body in those terms. And yet the reality is that if we are purposed by God and of God, we are called to fulfill that purpose faithfully with as much energy, as much passion, as much effectiveness for as long of a duration as we can. And I can't do that. You can't do that if we don't pay attention to the instrument that we're given to accomplish those things. Now that's going to look different for, for each and every one of us, right? For some of us, it may be something as simple as, am I doing the things to keep my body in relatively decent shape? For others of us, it may be, am I taking my medication the way the doctor says? Am I getting the checkups I need to do? Am I getting the rest that the doctor tells me I have to get? Am I doing the things that can make me as healthy as I can be so that I can fulfill the purposes of God in my life? That's a very individual conversation, but it's one that we need to have nonetheless. And so this is the superficial layer of renewal of body, reborn of body, that we have the right perspective about why we have the body, and then we do what we need to do to try to keep that instrument in nice, tuned-up fashion to sing whatever song we're called to sing as loud, as long, and as strong as we possibly can. But, like many infomercials, wait, there's more. Because if we look more at what Paul talks about here, he fleshes this out a little bit. He picks sexual immorality as kind of the go-to uh, sin that he's talking about here. If we read more of Corinthians, we see that this particular subject was a problem within that church, but I think we can extend a broader principle out uh, because he kind of starts this whole conversation talking about, um, about whether or not we're just kind of focused on you know, the food for the belly and the belly for food kind of a thing. And it, it goes with this sense of not just are we caring for the body, but where are we allowing that body to go? What circumstances do I put my body in? And what does that look like in terms of temptation? Another survey question. How many of us feed into temptation because it feels good? Oh, come on, you filthy liars. <laughs> My point was this morning is if it didn't feel good, we wouldn't do it. If every time we did something that was not within God's will, a yellow jacket stung us in the eye, we'd stop doing things that were out of line because it hurts. But there's something about temptation that is appealing, that, that seduces us to say, hey, this is going to be great. This is going to feel awesome. This is going to be wonderful. And we say, oh, really? And then we walk right into it. And it's that sense that we have to understand that these bodies that we live in are sensory organisms. We experience things. And some things feel really good. Whether it's because it feels good to the touch or whether it's because it feels good because it tastes really great or it smells really good or we like the way that it looks or the, the experience releases chemicals in our brain that makes us feel a certain way. There's lots of things in the world that would tempt us. And if we give in, there's some semblance of pleasure to it. Well, if I put my body into a situation where I know that there is an opportunity to engage in something that God does not want me to, but man, is it attractive. And I give in. What does that do? For most of us, is it we get a taste and then we're done with it? Or do we get a taste and we want more? Right? 
So we get a taste of something and we say, now I'm craving it, so then I indulge it. And the more I indulge it, the more I want it. The more I want it, the more I indulge it. And if whatever I'm doing is something that is not of God, I'm getting myself into a real hard situation. And even if something isn't necessarily overtly sinful, if I get more wrapped up in trying to make myself feel good than I do in living into who God has called me to be, is that what God desires for my life? No. Because if I'm more focused on this thing over here, whatever it may be, than I am on God, there's a word for that in Scripture. Does anybody know what it is? Usually it takes the form of a statue. Idolatry. Because I've placed my pleasure above God. And so when we talk about prioritizing our sense of who we are and being reborn of body, it's respecting the reality that our bodies are these experiential sensory machines that go around and the world will definitely try to take that machine and seduce it away from God and being aware of that so that we can be discerning about the circumstances we place ourselves in about the things we allow ourselves to engage in. And for everybody, that looks a little bit different, but it's nonetheless accurate because if we are called to use these bodies to glorify God by living into the purpose for which we've been created, and there's something over here that appeals to this sensory condition that I have, and it drags me away from that purpose, then I'm falling, falling into sin. It's perspective. What are these things? They're amazing. But boy, can they put us in a pickle. These bodies are very much, when we talk about the mind kind of being the filter last week between which all this input from the world comes to our spirit and from our spirit into the world, our bodies are really the front line between the world and the rest of us, between the world and who we are. Because our bodies take it all in right? And what we do with it, that's our mind. And then when we get to that spirit piece, or I should say spirit who we are, because remember, we're not our mind, we're not our body, we are the spirit God created us to be. So we got to be careful with this. Now, we have a little bit of a hiccup in here, but not a big one. Because we have this other scripture. Incidentally, if you pay attention, you realize that sometimes Jesus is really insulting. Did you hear what he says to these guys? Are you so dull? That is like biblical language for what kind of dimwit are you? And he's trying to make it like, get it through your head, folks. And he says something that might make it sound like everything that I've just said is meaningless. But don't worry, we're going to make that okay. He says, it's not what goes into the body that defiles it. It's what comes out of the body that defiles it, right? It's not what we get here. It's what we produce. It's what we spill into the world. And so we might be convinced to say, well, you've just told us that we're not supposed to, you know, engage in all of these things that are going to drink in the world and cause us to have a warped sense of what it means to be a person and you know, we should watch, you know, what we eat because our bodies are supposed to be healthy and, and we should be careful about what we look at and what we hear because those things can influence us. But if none of that matters, it's only what I do, who cares? Well, I've got two illustrations. I'm bracing myself because I know I'm going to get at least one head shake here in a second. And one statement. How many of you are familiar with this statement? Garbage in, garbage out. Okay? Now, to illustrate this, we have a friend of mine, Tim Goonan, who's Connor's dad, uh, and he runs a karate school out in Little... You know where this is going. <laughs> he runs a karate school out in Littlestown, and when we were up above Scranton, one Friday he drove the three and a half hours to come up and, and train with me for a little bit. And on that drive, you might suspect he got a little bit hungry. 
And he walks into our kitchen with kind of a panicked look on his face. And he's like, I need to use your bathroom. Some of you know the look. Most of us have had the look. Now, I can't remember if it was before or after he wrought whatever damage he wrought on our bathroom. But he says something to the effect of, I don't usually eat fast food. And let me tell you, you cannot dabble in McDonald's. <laughs> Garbage in. Problematic situations elsewhere. And then the other one that's more attuned into this sense of how what we take in can affect what we produce and some of you may have heard this before. It's a story of a monk who is walking down a path and he comes across the, uh, a young woman. And a young woman decides to put the monk into a bit of a conundrum. And she says, Mr. Monk, if you do not do one of the following, I'm going to take my own life. She says, you either need to eat this goat, marry me, or drink this bottle of wine. All right, I got to ask this. I didn't do this in the first service. If someone came up to you and you were single, right, and, and someone came and offered that to you, if you had to pick one of the three, how many of you would eat the goat? No goat? How many of you would marry the girl? How many of you would drink the wine? Okay. For how many of you was that not even a thought? <laughs> wine! <laughs> That's not a condemning statement. That's just, you know, let's laugh at ourselves a little bit. Um, but the monk is in a real conundrum here because he's taken a vow to protect all life, and he's also a strict vegetarian, so he can't, eat, he can't kill the goat. He certainly can't eat the meat. He's taken a strict vow of singleness and celibacy, so he can't marry the girl. And he's also taken a vow not to, to abstain from anything that's fermented, so he can't drink the wine. But he also realizes that above all of these, he's taken a vow to protect human life at all costs, even if it costs him his own. So allowing her by his inaction to take her own life is the number one thing he can't do, which means he's got to pick one of the other three. So he figures this. The goat is a living creature. I cannot kill the goat. And then he realizes, kind of like what Paul talks about a little bit in Corinthians, if I marry this girl, we dishonor each other. We're both dishonored because of the vows that I took. But if I drink the bottle of wine, I have only taken the, the, the bad karma onto myself. So that is the most selfless thing to do, is to drink the bottle of wine. So he drinks the bottle of wine, and he's three sheets to the wind, and they fly to Vegas and have a midnight wedding, and then for the celebration, they kill the goat and eat it. <laughs> Does that illustrate the notion that what we take in has a lot to do with what we produce? Okay? And it's not just a boozy monk with, <laughs> with, a, with a, a girl and a strange challenge. There are so many things out there that we have no choice but to consume or that are, th are thrust upon us. Uh, and there are certain situations that if we're in ministry and if we're loving people, we're going to find ourselves in positions of temptation. That's, that's kind of the nature of what it means to be a Christian going into a broken world and trying to influence it for Christ. But we do have to be discerning about what we allow and how we allow it to impact us because it matters. So we can say, yeah, what I consume doesn't defile me, but the question is, what's it doing once it's in there? And what is the primary means through which we consume anything? Our bodies, our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our general being of a physical creature. Being reborn of body understands that, considers it, and factors that in 
to the choices and the decisions that we make. Because all of it goes back to that first piece of it, which is why have we been given the body? We've been given the body to act in the world in a way that transforms it more into the kingdom of God. Our health impacts that. The circumstances we find ourselves in affects that. And the things that we allow to come into us affect that. Now, so we don't seem like we're a bunch of stick in the muds. Does this mean that God does not ever want you to experience pleasure? No. Not at all. Not at all. Um, does God mean that this never wants you to have a piece of pie? No. For me, that's pleasure. Pie. I love pie. <laughs> Okay. But there's boundaries. Any healthy thing has boundaries. And those boundaries are what help us to thrive in the midst of our Christian faith, trying to speak it into a broken world. Now, last thing, this is important. We're almost done. We parsed these out one Sunday at a time, largely because there's no way we could have covered them all on one Sunday. But when we talk about born of spirit, born of mind, born of body, are those three separate things or are those things that are tangled together? They're tangled up, right? They all affect each other. And so what we have to understand is that when one of those things starts to fall down, it affects the others. And when one of those things is lifted up, it also affects the others. So it's this constant awareness of mind, body, and spirit and what that's, what's happening with God and what's happening in our lives and what's happening in the world that helps us to continue down this road of rebirth. Because you remember in the first message, we acknowledged that being reborn is not one and done. Being reborn is the awakening. But now we're on a path, and that path is growth. And each one of those steps of growth is another sense of rebirth. And so... If you're anything like me at all, what, what you are coming to realize is this. When we're reborn of spirit, that's awesome. But being reborn of mind and being reborn of body takes real work. And it takes time. And it, it takes failure and getting up again after the failure by the grace of God and with the help of God to do better the next time. And so... Because it's a process, and because it is something that by its nature is going to include stumbling, can you do it alone? I can't. I was talking to somebody the other day. He was one of Sarah's relatives, actually. I'm not sure which one it was. Um, but I made the statement that sometimes I wonder if, if God called me to be a pastor because God knew if left to my own devices, I probably would be out there flailing around someplace, not necessarily plugged into a community of faith. Now I got no choice. I got to be here. Jerks. <laughs> and I love it. I mean, this is, this, this, is the, this, this is the thrill of my life being a pastor. It's wonderful. Um, but the reality is that the community of faith is here because we can't do it alone. I mean, what is the community of faith called in Corinthians? The body of Christ, right? So we need to be together. We need to support each other. We need to talk with each other, pray with each other, pray for each other. We need to study together. We need to know each other. That's part of what community does for us. We need to find those people and places that don't just uplift us as people, but uplift us as people of faith. In those seasons of life when we find that to be difficult, we still need to find a way to plug in somehow because we can't do it alone. And we should never feel alone on this journey. And there's one more factor that goes into this. How many of you are perfect? How many of you know everything? 
How many of you have a complete corner on the nature and the mind of God? So here we are, a bunch of people that don't know what they're doing, <laughs> trying to figure it out. So we also lean on the Holy Spirit. We come together because together when we are gathered, there's a special presence of the Holy Spirit. There's something that happens when the Spirit is speaking through you and you and you and you and me and we're all gathered together and something special happens. We gain insight. We gain, we gain perspective. Uh, we feel the warmth and the power of God in ways we wouldn't all by ourselves. And those things help us in this continual process of being reborn. And we get to celebrate with each other whenever we're bold enough to share with one another those aha moments and awakenings that we have along the way, which is awesome. I want to encourage you, especially this time of year, Advent, man, this is the, this is the time of year to make sure we are gathered together as a community. Because something celebrated at Christmas I know there's a lot of things celebrated at Christmas. I want to see if you guys are able to, to hone in on it. First service didn't get it. We'll see if anybody pipes it up here. This is one of the essential things that brings us together, that binds us together, and that makes us sure that this path and journey we are on is correct and will bear fruit. What broke into the world on Christmas morning? Jesus isn't the answer. We know that. Say that again. Happy dance. Yup. <laughs> hope. We are in the season of hope. And this communal effort through this process of being reborn is so important because there's going to come a place where you're going to hit a wall, where I'm going to hit a wall, and we're not going to have hope, and we need someone to have that hope for us and to remind us that it exists. That's here. So join me this season as we celebrate hope coming into the world. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Gracious God, we thank you for these miraculous things that our spirit travels around in. We thank you for every bit of opportunity that comes from these machines that you have given us. We thank you for the ability to speak and act your love into this world. And so we ask that you would help us as we go through this world to have a renewed perspective on why we are inside of these bodies, to use them to glorify you and to change this world. Lord, may all that we do be designed to or encourage or feed our ability to live into the purpose for which we were created. And we trust that as we do this, this experience, this excitement of rebirth will happen for us again and again as we grow and deepen in faith, as we love and grow together. And Lord, that in our own transformation, we will see the world around us to transform more into the likeness of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and join together in the first verse of Trust and Obedience.